a quilt can be anything. I, I tend to impose these unspoken rules on myself, perfectionist traits that I'm battling with my entire life. So it's really been freeing as much as it's kind of the tight process. It's actually been very freeing to let go of the idea of a quilt is this thing. You're listening to Seam Side, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster, and today we sit down with textile artist Victoria Vanderlaan. Before we sit down and talk with Victoria, and I can't wait for y'all to meet her, two items of business. Number one, we got a review to read. Listen to this one from my friend Joanne. Joanne says, Zach puts words to how we feel about textiles and fabrics. His calm and inviting manner lets the conversations with his guests flow as if we are right there with them. The topics are challenging and understood at the same time. The conversations open the creative doors and encourage us to find our own creative directions. You'll be inspired. Mm, Joanne, thank you so much. If you're feeling inspired by these conversations here on Seamside, one little thing that you could do, well, it seems little, but it actually means a lot. If you could leave me a review, a kind five-star review on Apple Podcast, it really is the best way to help other people find the magic that is Seamside. So thank you very much. I also want to let you know how much fun we're having over at the Nook. We've started these all weekend sewing circles. I don't know where we got the idea from, but we just start a Zoom meeting on Friday afternoon and let it run all weekend long. You can come and go as you please. And that's working really well for, well, all of us, actually, because we don't need to commit to a time. We don't need to schedule anything. Turns out Saturday mornings are really good for me. I was kind of hesitant about scheduling sewing circles for a Saturday morning because, you know, it's my weekend. But turns out I love being able just to pop in, see what other folks are working on while I'm working on my own work. Like this past weekend, I was working on a quilt that I wanted to dangle some little fabric beads, but I couldn't quite engineer how to get the fabric beads to stick to the quilt, but also float off the surface of the quilt so they would catch the breeze. I just hop into the all weekend sewing circle and walk away with a half a dozen different ideas that I'm I'm still working through to see which one's going to be the best solution. So all of that is to say, if you could use some like real low key, low maintenance quilty company with warm, generous, and intelligent people, come on by the Nook. We would love to have you. We got a spot at the table for you. You can find a link to your free trial to the Quilty Nook in the show notes below. I first met Victoria Vanderlaan in Catskill, New York, standing in the gravel driveway in front of the Huddle House, where me and 25 other Nookers had gathered to spend a long weekend quilting together. I had assumed that Victoria, who had driven 45 minutes south, by the way, just to come pick me up, would just whisk me away for a quick coffee and pastry while I was in town, and that would be it. But Victoria ended up coming back to the house for a trunk show, and then spent all afternoon with us just sewing and sharing stories. Noticing the warmth and generosity with which she moves through the world, I knew in that moment that we would become fast friends. So in this seamside conversation, Victoria and I talk about how the demands of life can pressurize our creative practice. We talk about why her colors seem to vibrate and how to expand and contract as the season allows. I hope you enjoy How to Bloom in Season with my good friend, Victoria Vanderlaan. Victoria, welcome to Seamside. Thanks for having me, Zach. It's so good to see your smile on face again. You and I (laughs) met up in real life for the first time when I was up in Catskill for the Nook Huddle back in January. And I saw you're in the area, so I looked you up and you very graciously agreed to drive, what is it, about 45 minutes south to come hang out with us? Yeah, it it was absolutely lovely. I was so honored to be asked and I just had such a blast with everybody. It was wonderful. I mean, I thought we were just going to get together for coffee and a pastry or something, but then we ended up hanging out the rest of the afternoon. You came over, we sat and sewed with all the huddlers. It was really sweet. I didn't want to leave. (laughs) We couldn't get you out of there. We couldn't get you out of the huddle house. But it was so fun because 
as I was walking you to your car out in the driveway, I remember that I was like, Victoria, I want to get you on seam side. There's so much more I want to know about who you are as a person and your work and what you're bringing into this world. So thank you for sitting down with us this morning to, to share those stories. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Zach. So paint the picture for us a little bit, Victoria. Where are you right now? So I'm in my studio, which is in my home. We have, we live in the, in downtown Albany and we have a sort of urban row house. So we live in the top two stories of this house. And in the third floor, I have my studio. It's a lovely spot with nice windows, nice light, but it is open to the rest of the house. So I'm extremely grateful to have this space. There are moments when it feels a little little too open and and part of the day-to-day life of my family. Right now, everybody's out. My youngest is at school. My partner's out botanizing. And yeah, so I'm here on my own. It's fairly quiet. I do have my three cats who may zoom through here occasionally during our talk. Feline's always welcome. Yeah. Have you had a moment today to be working on anything? Not yet. I'm sort of, I'm working on more sort of its application season. So I'm doing a lot of the updating of my, you know, CV and my artist statement and all of that sort of thing. So it's a lot of sort of administrative work these days and not as much creating, unfortunately. That is a real (laughs) slice of life though. I mean, that's just how it has to happen sometimes. Yeah, it is. So actually this morning I just kind of took it slow and just thought about our talk. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. I love yeah. that. You first got on my radar. I should say your work first got on my radar through the weekly pay-as-you-wish stretched quilt frames that you make that have such a distinctive voice to them. And it's so funny because they're small. They're more or less simple geometry, solid colors. But there's something about your palette and the way you juxtapose shapes together that feels very I mean there's a vibrancy to them Victoria Mm. they radiate they just like sit together and they just like wiggle like I just imagine like if you zoom into like atoms close enough they say that they're just like in state of constant (laughs) vibration in the best of all possible ways and that's how I feel about those stretch canvases that you make how did you get started making those that's oh thank you that feels like such a wonderful compliment um it's interesting. I've always kind of made little sort of maquettes or little sketches, little little auditions of ideas for larger work. You know, as we all know, a quilt takes a long time to make. So you don't want to, you know, you might have an idea, but then to execute it in large scale and you don't like it, that's kind of a, a big waste of time and resources. I think, you know, it's a combination between having a bunch of these little what I consider textile sketches. That's what I call them. Not, I'm not a person who draws. I don't, I don't sketch my ideas down with a pencil. I kind of put it together with fabric bits. You know, having all of these little textile sketches hanging out, thinking about what I could do with them. I am not precious about the pieces I make, even the, the main body, my ba- main body of work. I'm ready to for it to be out the door as soon as I'm done with it. I don't want to hold on to things really. So thinking about what to do with these little sketches while also kind of really interrogating my own position within the art world and the economy of the art world and thinking about how, you know, I I'm trying to balance making a living as an artist, but also having my work be accessible you know, I'm a big fan of Jen Maus, who you've spoken to on Seam Side, and I had been following her Pay What You Can project and realized that this I had in in, in my hands, the, these sketches were sort of a low stakes thing that I could offer to the world for whatever price folks wanted to pay or were able to pay. So then I was actually at a residency with a painter who was stretching canvases. And it just was sort of a light bulb moment of, oh, (laughs) canvas is fabric. So is my textile sketch. I could stretch this on a small canvas. So really that's when the idea was born. She taught me how to do it, how to stretch the, the pieces. And what did that do for you? If I can interrupt for just a moment, what did that do for you when you saw this 
quilt top stretched over a canvas frame. So yeah, this is a whole other sort of level of my work where I have for a long time really been committed to maintaining the quilt form, to ma maintaining the usefulness of the quilt, even if it is, you know, wall sized, is just small, as sort of a way to assert that quilts are art. Just as they are. Just as they are. Yeah, they're f they can be functional and they are still art. They're, every quilt is a work of art, you know, and not just quilts, other, other textile arts as well. But I had a bit of a hang up about stretching it and then, you know, sort of th then it becomes like a painting, which I believe that the functional quilt is <laughs> It's maybe even higher that I, I might hold it in a higher esteem than a painting. But, you know, I, I kind of had to get over that hang up of my own of, of no, a, a quilt is a quilt. It needs to be quilted. It needs to be finished with a facing or binding. It needs to be functional, even if it's not functional. So it took a little getting over that hang up in order to be able to really pursue this idea. But I'm all in now. <laughs> Victoria, what did you see happening when you stretched the fabric over a frame that made it worth kind of redefining what you understood a quilt to be? I think, you know, what's interesting when you stretch a piece, you can really start to see the, the stitches. They become a little bit more visible, even though my format is really Instagram. <laughs> so folks are seeing these, you know, in a tiny screen and they think they're paintings because you can't really see those details. But in person, you absolutely can see those, those stitches, which I think is really amazing. And a lot of times, if I really want to enunciate the stitches, I'll use some sort of contrast colored thread, which adds this whole other level. And I think often when I make a quilt that's meant to be quilted, a you know, a pet piece of patchwork that I'm going to layer and quilt. I, I really take a moment to pause before the quilting process and think, oh, it's perfect just as it is. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to quilt it because you, you know, a lot of my work is very, it's very rigidly geometric. And once you start quilting something, it adds, it changes it. And I always am very thrilled with how that it, it gives it a texture. It gives it this softness that is lovely. And it's a great sort of contrast to that hard, rigid line. But often I really, I really love the non-quilted too. So it's sort of like, this is best, best of both worlds. I'm able to, <laughs> I don't have to limit myself to one thing. This is something I, I tend to impose these unspoken rules on myself. Every quilt must be finished as a quilt or, you know, the lines have to be, per you know, all of these sort of perfectionist traits that I'm battling with my entire life I've been battling with. So it's really been freeing as much as it's kind of tight. Stretching those canvases is a tight process. It's actually been very freeing to let go of the idea of, you know, a quilt is this thing. A quilt can be anything. And it I actually think of it more as patchwork. So it's a, it's like an element of the quilt, you know? Yeah. And that's a lot of the, for me, almost all of the thought and, and intuitive process is in the piecing of the patchwork. And then the quilting, even when I quilt a piece is very much, uh, it's not my favorite part, <laughs> but I'm machine quilting. If I were hand quilting, I might really love it. I mean, I certainly love other people's hand quilting. So right now it's not really in the cards as I need to kind of produce more than I'm able to do by hand, but yeah. I've seen the wall in your studio that is just beautifully sorted fabric organized by the rainbow color spectrum. Can you talk for a moment about how you approach picking colors for these small pieces? I'm sure it's a, I imagine it's a largely intuitive process, but could, if, if you could put some words to it for us, I think that could be really interesting. Sure. Yeah. So first of all, I would say that I approach, you know, the fabric as sort of my palette. So much like a painter, I, I think I actually work a lot having, met more and more painters, I'm realizing I maybe I work a little bit more like a painter than I do like a quilter, where I'm really, it's mostly about the color and the form. For these small sketches, I'm working almost exclusively with scraps. 
So I'm not so much pulling from that wall <laughs> of fabrics that you see, although I have it all visible like that so that if I feel like, oh, I really need a, a bright green in this, I'll just pull one out and zip a piece off of, of, of a piece of fabric. But for the most part, I am working from a scrap bin and I'm working as much as possible with the scraps and the shapes that they come in. I might see a bunch of strips and think, okay, I'm going to piece together, I'm going to use a log cabin construction to see what happens. Or I'm going to make a bunch of strip sets and see what happens. Maybe I'll like them as is. Maybe I'll cut them up and make an improvisational checkerboard or something. You know, I kind of just let the, the fabrics, not the colors and the shapes of the scraps lead the process. And I make very quick as much as possible. Sometimes I get hung up on it and overthink it, but I try to make just like instant decisions on what to do next within a textile sketch. Cause it truly is like a sketching practice. Everything is open to me and I, I learn a lot through it. Have you ever made one of the little sketches that you didn't like that you just, Oh, all the time. Oh. I would say, <laughs> I mean, as artists, we're meant to make, we can't, not everything we make is perfect. Mm -hmm. We're making bad work is just as important as making good work because you learn, probably learn more from the bad work <laughs> or the work that you don't like personally. It's not to say it's bad, but I would say I probably love maybe 10% of what I make with this sketching practice and dislike, <laughs> like strongly <laughs> dislike maybe another 10%. And then the rest is sort of in between, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see having this project where I'm putting five out every week to the world and see which, which ones are the most popular is so interesting. Just a little note, I always put my favorite as the first one. <laughs> my favorite of the week is number one. So that's a way for me to be able to like track over time. Okay, people really don't like the, <laughs> the same ones that I like or whatever. This week, actually, people liked that one. That's cool. But it's just really interesting. It's sort of a little game I play with myself of, you know, which one's the most popular this week? And then I kind of, it doesn't necessarily inform how I go forward, like my next work, but I, it definitely is a little worm in my, in my ear, but like, oh yeah, maybe I will work with that color combination again or whatever. Yeah. Let's sit with that for just a moment because as artists, we are now working in a time that no other artist has experienced before mm -hmm. and that we get yeah. lots of instant feedback, both solicited yeah. and unsolicited <laughs> about our work. And even if we're not trying to adjust what we make based on the feedback that we get, like you said, it can't help but work its way in. Yeah. And so how, how have you seen the feedback that you get impact your, th these pieces that you make? Hmm. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I do still, even though these pieces, I've made thousands of them at this point and well, at least a thousand, maybe not multiple thousands. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really still kind of think of them as experiments, but they really, they truly have become a huge central part of my practice. So even though I'm still like, this is my sketching practice, actually, you know, and I think of them as being auditions for ideas for larger work. However, I haven't had a ton of time to make larger work. So as I continue to work through these pieces, I think I find, you know, people love the log cabin ones that just kind of like, so if I'm not sure what I want to do, I'll always do log cabins because people love them. And I'm like, am I making, so then I get in my head of, and well, am I doing this? Is this my sketching practice anymore? Or am, am I making products for people? Right. Because I know that that's what, you know, but I'm okay with that as well. I mean, I do need to support my family on this. You that's know, reality. it's not, yeah. And it's not that this project, the pay what you can project alone is like supporting my family. Not at all, but you know, it's a factor in my, in the, in the whole, in the big picture. So yeah, I mean, it's in there and it's a thought and it is true that I am presenting these as items to be purchased for whatever price. So yeah, I'm not going to like go nuts and, and do something. Well, maybe at some point I will go nuts and do something crazy, but <laughs> I hope you do. 
I do too. But for right now, I think, you know, I am just kind of sticking with the same kind of formula of just working with scraps, working with color, working with forms, and really making the ones I like the most, you know, and, and delving into the ideas that I like the most. And when you first do an idea, it's, it's new, it's not fully developed, it's maybe not the best it can be. So the more you do the same idea, the more you find you know, kind of perfect it. Nothing is perfect, but you get to a you closer. You zero in. You zero in, exactly. So I think I am maybe zeroing in on things that then become popular. People are interested because they're getting better. Or I don't, I don't know if that fully answered your No, question. it 100% does. That there's multiple forces at work here. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. I think about this, and I think a lot of artists think about this, because I know that recently, for example, I was talking to my good friend, Heidi Parks, who is in the middle of a residency that's in a very public space. And so she has a lot of her quilts hanging up around the studio. And she's been really surprised that when people walk in, they always point to the same quilt, which is this Mm. black and white quilt that she would not have picked as her favorite necessarily. I don't want to put words in her mouth, but she's just surprised at how much attention that gets. And so a question that I have in my mind as her friend is, oh, are you going to start making more black and white quilts? You <laughs> yeah. know, like it's easy to understand <laughs> why people's eyes are drawn to it. It's so bold. It's so graphic. And it's one of my favorite quilts of hers. But I'm like, oh, with this real-time feedback, is that going to creep its way into your practice? And that's not a bad thing. Maybe creep is not the word to use it. Is it going to continue to mold and give shape to your practice? Mm-hmm. I think also that I recently had a coffee date with an art advisor who says, you know what? The only art I can sell these days are bright, happy flowers. And I was Ooh. like, oh. <laughs> and so for me personally, just to be a little vulnerable and pull the curtain back a little bit, you know, for, for two years now, I've been working on Southern White Amnesia. And that collection is, I feel like, beginning to wrap up with this last piece that I've done that I haven't been able to share yet. I I made a piece recently that just felt like it was the culmination of the collection. And then I had that moment that inspired the new apocalypse collection that I'm making. The moment that that happened, it was, it was a phone call. Someone was asking me to commit to teaching in the spring of 2025. And my knee jerk reaction was, Oh, that's cute. You think we're still going to be here. You think civilization is still going to be functioning. That's I love that about you. And noticing that knee jerk, deeply ingrained reaction in me made me want to explore how to present images of a very possible positive future for people to imagine. And so here I am working on this and I've got all these ideas and it's, oh, this is going to be a great new collection. And then, you know, a couple weeks into it, my mind connects back to that coffee date that I had with the art advisor who said, all I can sell are bright, happy flowers. I'm like, oh. So my question for myself is, to what extent did that comment about bright, happy flowers impact Mm. the direction that I end up taking with the new apocalypse. I'm going to say very little, but I'm not going to say zero. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I think just this is sort of, it's it's definitely related, but a little off topic. But I think um, I've been thinking a lot about the importance of sort of envisioning and embodying what, like a future that you want and not focusing on the negative and thinking, oh, well, you know, we're not gonna be around in 2025 or whatever. I think it can be, it can be hard. The world right now is wild, like things happening. It's very hard to stay positive, but it's imperative to envision that positive future. So I think the whole, like, all I can sell right now is flowers is maybe a manifestation of folks thinking, okay, (laughs) you know, I, the world is heavy we need things that inspire us to imagine more positive change, more beauty in the world. So maybe a, a little of both and, you're, and, and that person is sort of picking up on this collective intuition that we need to envision. And as artists, it's kind of our job to envision that positive future in order for it to be able to be embodied and become true. If that makes sense. It makes 100% (laughs) sense. And I would say that a truly positive future is one that starts with looking current reality straight in the eyes and saying, here is what we're up against. Here's what we're facing. And we're not going to 
put blinders on. We're not going to put our head in the sand. We're going to deal with this so that we can get to this very possible positive future. Yeah, absolutely. I do not in any any sense of the imagination mean to say we should be all to be delusional and think, you know, just <laughs> <No>. ignore. <laughs> oh, that sounds kind of nice some days. <laughs> it is, there are moments, but yeah. no, we need to take action to embody that positivity. And that begins with facing the issues and reconciliation and all of that sort of stuff. But yeah, I think I'm really excited to see this new uh, direction for you. Oh, I'm having so much fun. So much fun. Yeah. I can't wait to share more about this with you. Let's segue just a little bit because you brought it up a moment ago. And that is that we have our creative practices. And as much as we would like to hold those in this perfect little vacuum where nothing ever touches it, that it can just be its own beautiful, perfect thing, to use your words, this own beautiful, perfect thing. There's also the reality of the lives that we live, the people who are depending on us. So that creeps in. And you mentioned Jennifer Mao in the conversation with her recently. The last time that she and I caught up was for her backstitch episode a year after the first time that we had spoken. And that was a very frank and vulnerable conversation on her part. She was saying, you know, right now I don't feel inspired to make work. Now I'm happy to report since then she is, you know, back on the creative wagon or whatever. And she's feeling much more optimistic about things. But there are seasons and there are things that take us away from that idealized version of a creative practice that we have in our mind's eye. And I know that's something that occupies a good degree of your bandwidth, just from conversations you and I have had yeah. in the past. Can we explore <laughs> yeah. that a little bit together? Sure. So when you and I were planning for today's conversation, the very first thing out of your mouth was, I just feel so scattered right now. <laughs> right? Like it wasn't yeah. that when I asked what was top of mind and when I asked what you wanted to talk about, it wasn't this big new project. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I'm really excited about this collection I'm working on or this opportunity I've gotten. It's, I feel so scattered. Mm -hmm. And that's reality, right? Yep. So, how are you experiencing this scatteredness? And then, what kinds of things do you find, if anything, helps you bring that focus back to center? Yeah, I think. For me, I'm just in general, the kind of person who's, oh, I have something scheduled today for an hour. Like, I, I can't possibly book anything out. Like, I'm like a one thing a day kind of person. I'm me not too. a multitasker. <laughs> you know, I want to focus my full attention on the thing at hand. The truth of an artist's life is that, you know, if you're just an independent artist trying to make a go... You know, without gallery representation and all of that, you are doing so many jobs <laughs> simultaneously. And add to that, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a friend, I'm a daughter, I, I'm a sister. You know what I mean? I have so many roles. And just in the past, like, I would say about six months, well, really, truly my entire adult life, but, you know, particularly in the past six months or so, it has felt really overwhelming partly because I've taken on kind of the entirety of our family's um, financial breadwinning, basically, as my partner transitions careers, which I'm thrilled to be able to do. The fact is I'm doing it. It's amazing. But it's a lot. <laughs> so I find, you know, I also sort of wrapped up a, a large series of work that I had been working on. I think it's pretty much resolved. You know, I have this ongoing pay what you can project, which is going, but I don't really have another big creative project I'm in the middle of. Like, I feel like I'm, I need to start one, start a new series, but I, ha I feel like I don't have the time or bandwidth to really even consider that. So I think I feel a little stuck creatively. I feel very lucky that I have this project to keep me kind of honest, you know, to keep me making. It is still a blessing and I still love it. But I think without having something I'm super excited about creatively beyond sort of my ongoing sketching practice, I don't have maybe that full excitement of making. And yet all of the peripheral requirements and tasks need to continue to be done. And in fact, maybe are picking up as I try to diversify my income, do teaching, figure out grants and, you know, other, other licensing and different things that I could pursue in order to make this a more sustainable 
financially sustainable practice. So it's been, it's been feeling like a lot because I just want to make textile art. <laughs> I just want to make patchwork pieces. I just want to d- dive deeper into the possibilities of textiles. And it's very hard to find that time to experiment beyond what is comfortable and what I'm doing. And that kind of ties back into sort of the commercial sustainability of it. You know, well, I know this sells, so I should probably just keep doing it. And I still love doing it, but it's like, I, I feel a pull to something more. It's such a challenge because we, yeah. we have to make a livelihood. And I do prefer yeah. the term livelihood over living. Absolutely. Right. We got to make a livelihood. I am, I, for myself, am looking to create a sustainable life with dependable income that keeps mm. Bill anxiety at bay. That's all I need. I just want to keep Bill anxiety at bay. And then I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm happy. And I feel like the the truth for me is that as an artist, I just need time and space, yeah. psychic space, physical yeah. space. And it doesn't always look like I'm, well, I think it actually does look like I'm always busy and doing something. But my best time comes on the weekends because Monday through Friday tends to be divided like you were talking about between kind of the administrative side of being an artist and the creative side. But then on Saturday and Sunday, I say, Zach, part of my deal to myself is I don't do computer work on the weekend. Mm -hmm, Smart. And then I can just (laughs) really just gather up a lot of good momentum and steam with the creative projects, you know, on Saturday and Sunday. And that's where I get a lot of the momentum from. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's funny because I'm actually trying to not do any work on the weekend. I mean, I'm always doing some kind of hand project, but I've been trying to protect my weekends from work. Work being, you know, I do the work of textile art, but that's not been happening. (laughs) (laughs) I have deadlines. I do have projects happening, sort of behind the scenes projects. So I tend to, you know, I'm a people pleaser. So if I say yes to somebody, I'm not going to rescind that. And that there are times when I really regret that trait. <laughs> like I can't just say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what? I was wrong. I can't Oops. do this. But yeah. One of the things that I'll often do when I'm feeling creatively stuck is go back and look at past pieces I've made that mm. really felt deep and resonant to me at the time. Would you mind if I pulled up a few examples of your work that sure. I saw this morning getting ready for our talk that I was like, Victoria, you made this? Because like you were saying, so much of what you present on Instagram are these sketches that are beautiful and complete and gorgeous. But then there's a whole, there are whole other facets to your creative practice. And so the first one I made my jaw drop is a double standard. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration and then what is it even? So that is a piece like I've, I've made very few pieces in this series that is sort of an ongoing series called Invisible Quilts that, you know, began as sort of, it's just a sort of social commentary quilts. I had been really wanting to work with textiles that are sort of imbued with meaning and incorporate them into my quilting practice. So I had thought about like money bags and prison uniforms and things like that. But the thing that I had on hand was a bunch of discarded American flags. So these American flags were like, I don't know what the word, not decommissioned, because that would, (laughs) but they were just like being disposed of. Mm -hmm. So this piece was made from discarded flags that were gathered. They were meant to be like thrown away, but you don't just throw away flags. There's like a procedure. So I gathered a bunch of those. I have my methods. And I, you know, some of them were just like those little flags that you like, stick in the lawn, kind of like the little four by six inch flags. And so you can kind of see the disparity in the, I don't know if you can tell, but the red, red ziggy zags are the, the stripes of the flag. And then the dark part in the center, the the hourglass is the stars. So I just started making, again, I often default to a, a log cabin construction when I'm not sure what to do. So this is actually courthouse steps construction. And it just started making this, <laughs> this amazing pattern. The stripes started making this amazing pattern. And then I kind of leaned into that and kind of encouraged that to continue as I was piecing tiny little strips. These strips were probably as small as like quarter inch. There, it's all sort of improv piece. So there was no rulers used. Courthouse steps with very tiny steps. 
<laughs> yeah, very, very small steps. Mm-hmm. And it's almost <laughs> like um, an ikat weaving or something, right? Where it's like... The, it does look like ikat. They were originally stripes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they were stripes. And yeah, I just, I just kind of went for it and really love... I love that it's a traditional quilt pattern. And using this this deeply imbued kind of you know, textile you know it's hard to work with I, I actually ended up working with the printed flags instead of the truly like the sewn flags because those have like French seams and mm. you know they're hard to work yeah. with so it's very inexpensive like cheap kind of polyester I don't even know what kind of fabric so it definitely kind of buckles a little bit as well it's not it doesn't work like cotton and it's just it's a really I think it turned out it, it's like a really powerful piece. I'm really proud of this piece. I don't talk about it a lot, so I really appreciate you bringing it up. And this piece was actually acquired by my local, like the Albany Institute of History and Art. So they own a ton of Hudson River paintings in this piece. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see why they wanted to collect it. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's, this is, again, it's sort of about what we were talking about. It was like, envisioning a future that is for everyone this is about sort of reclaiming the american flag which is an emblem that is deeply problematic to me i mean in high school i would i refused to stand for for the pledge and i had to leave the room I, this whole thing so working with the flags was it was really powerful for me and the results i'm so happy with i feel like it just kind of magically came to together and yeah so yes it's about envisioning a future that includes everyone reworking what we already have in in our vision yeah you know and the american presidential campaign season of 2015 Mm -hmm. needs not be said but it it was tough for a lot of folks to endure and the toll that that took on me was I just stopped sewing. That was my last big creative dry spell. Like almost a year, oh. I didn't make a single thing. And I was reading this essay by Barbara Kingsolver, who in mm. this house just goes by Barbara. That's how often we talk about yeah. her. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And Barbara was talking about how, and this is back in the 90s, that no one political party in any country owns the flag, right? Yes. And so what kind of work can we do if we choose to, to re-envision the flag or make it live up to what we know it can be and i read that essay that night and i was like yeah exactly barbara's so right (laughs) and i hopped on the giant online commercial ship straight to your door place and (laughs) i put an american flag in my cart and i almost click buy now and then i was like whoa whoa zach wait a second this is how deep (laughs) i was in the hole i was like you know how to sew you can just make a flag and that was the first thing I sewed in over a year. And that flag went with me to actions, protests, parades, marches. I mean, it's it's been on the front pages of international newspapers. It's been all over the place. And it now hangs, for the most part, on our living room wall, which is still a little curious, right? Like sometimes my partner feels a little uneasy with it being visible. Like if he has like a work call, let's say. And he he feels uneasy. Like, what will people think if I'm someone with an American flag hanging up in my apartment? And I'm like, I got you. Take it down. No problem. But here's what I want to say is that this country can be so much more. We have never stopped working. We can continue to work to make it what we know it can be. And so for me, when I look at the flag, that's what I choose to see. That is the power of the American flag for me is this idea of a promise and working towards the promise. Yeah. Yeah. And I think honestly, since making this piece, I feel a little bit better about the flag, maybe Mm -hmm. in the same way that you approach it Mm -hmm. now. Yeah. I could never have imagined ever even, well, I still probably wouldn't hang a flag, but but yeah, that's, I, I think we just have to, you know, again, in whatever way we can to envision a better future, We've got to do it. Got to do you know, it. if we all did it, things would change. That's right. So another collection that I find really fascinating, and in keeping with the sketches that you make, but also divergent from them, is this collection that you call intuitive work, which are made with intuitive industrial approaches. They're very kind of like oozy. Like I get like lava <laughs> lamp vibes from so many of yeah. them, right? Love can, that. can you talk a little bit about these pieces and... 
what they mean to you, what you're thinking about and yeah. what they do for you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. These, these pieces I feel like are the most specific to me. I don't think I've ever seen another quilter make work like this. So when I first kind of did it, I, it, it sort of sparked something like there was a tingle of, oh, this is mine. <laughs> like, you know, how often can we say that truly? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm using traditional quilt techniques to make plays on traditional quilt blocks. So it's, you know, it's all kind of been done before and we all put our personal spin on it. And not to say like I invented anything here, but I just think working through this, this idea of, you know, I, these also, I also consider them sort of stacked forms and I'm really about, you know, earlier you mentioned how the work kind of vibrates, which is, I love hearing that people see that because I'm always looking for a vibration between colors, between forms. And so I really challenge myself with these pieces to get the pieces as close together as possible, but not quite touching to have that true vibration. And this is all pieced. None of this is appliqued. It's all pieced in. And that's another, it's kind of my obsession with process and craft. (laughs) I'm just like, I know I could applique these forms on, it would be fairly easy, but I want to try to figure out how to piece them together just to make it as hard as possible. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, when I learned to sew curves, which took me many years to psych myself up to, which is, I look back and I'm like, what was I scared of? That's, you know, it just blew up in my work. If you look at my work before curves... (laughs) BC. Um, (laughs) It was very geometric and rigid, which I still sometimes do. And I loved that. I do still like that. Bringing in an organic curved shape opens up a lot more emotion in my work, I think. So I began making these kind of stacked forms. Originally, they were based on sort of like stacks of stone, stone walls, you know, where I live, like in the Catskills, Hudson Valley region, there's tons of that kind of stuff. And so I'm very influenced by kind of the natural world. And so I, you know, I just, I started making these stacked forms and figuring out this sort of gestural approach and not thinking anything out or sketching anything out, just basically choosing the fabrics and then just going. So I think making these, I get in some sort of Zen place. It's a very moving meditation for me. I love making these. And it's this is a great reminder for me, like, oh, go back to that a little bit. See what else I can do with that. Because I, I feel like I've only really taken a first pass at this idea. I can think about other things I could do with this as well. So And what would those things be then? I mean, so you made a lot of these pieces, it looks like three or four years ago, right? Yeah. Most of them, yeah. Yep. So then how would all these little sketches you've been making, how do you see that kind of like flowing back into something that's more along the lines of intuitive work here? I'm not really sure. What's what's really interesting is we, we, you kind of asked me that question in earlier conversation and I, I've been thinking about it and I'm like, you know what? It's hard for me to wrap my head around it because I truly do do my thinking with textiles. Like I don't, I don't sketch, I don't draw them out. I don't, I can kind of have ideas in my head, but they're super abstract and, and not very practical. So that might be like a place of inspiration of just these like visions in my head. But truly once I get the fabric out and I start cutting it and piecing it together, that's when I sort of figure out what's going to happen. So well, truly, I don't figure out what's going to happen until it's happened. <laughs> and you look at it and you're like, wow, that happened. I like oh, it. Oh, that was cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's almost like I'm like, you know, possessed by some, you know, quilting spirit. <laughs> it mm-hmm. just makes it all happen. But no, that, that quilting spirit is me, you know. Right. So I'm not sure what would happen. I'd probably just cut it up, piece it back together, try to, I don't know. I'm I'm truly not sure. Maybe over dyeing, maybe adding embroidery, appliqueing on top. Like you're such an inspiration, Zach, you and Amanda Nadig and Heidi Parks and just all, you know, there's so many inspiring folks out there who I feel like we can all learn from each other. And we have been. And we have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not about like copying. It's more about, oh, that technique is so interesting. What would my take be on that? So I definitely have, I want to find the time (laughs) to explore all of these things. The magic time turner that I can make it, make it all happen, but it will, it will get there. It's just in this season of life, things are very busy. 
but yeah, it's going to happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. One thing I would think would be really dynamic, just knowing how you put colors together, would be to make two intuitive work pieces like what we see here, but then like Mm. slice them in half and recombine them. So now you have two entirely different color stories coexisting. Yeah. So I I did do that idea once, but I don't know where that would be. It was really interesting. And I was like, I should explore this idea more. And again, I got sidetracked. (gasps) So another thing I should say, I very much consider myself an emerging artist. Like Mm. I did not even consider myself an artist before the age of 40. I'm 47 right now. So the first time I called myself an artist was at 40. It was another couple of years before I truly believed it. (laughs) You know, I'm still, I'm still emerging. I'm still figuring out my voice. I'm still, I think, you know, I very much embrace a beginner's mind. I'm always looking to learn and broaden the scope of my skills so that I can then bring that into my work. But I think during the time when I was really making these intuitive pieces, I was very fixed on two, maybe three colors. I did not feel comfortable working with more than two or three colors. So that's part of the sketching practice, too, is learning, you know, getting comfortable using more than two colors. That's been huge. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But there is magic in two color quilts. The way that, like, when you make a bunch of blocks out of two colors, the Mm. way that those blocks when you put two edges of the same color together an entirely new shape is born absolutely and it's true there's there's some alchemical magic in that one of the things that's been such a treat about my friendship with amanda nadig and she's probably listening hi amanda is that <laughs> i have known her for less time than i've been a quilter right and so yeah. i got to witness the beginning of her quilting journey and then over the last three or four years i believe it is really just like blossom into f- just making this incredible work with such a distinctive voice. Yeah. And one of the things that she taught me just by modeling is that one of the ways we can access our creative voice is just through sheer volume of production, right? Just make and make Absolutely. and make and make and yeah. make and don't get too hung up. If something's not working, yeah. hop onto the next and make and make and make because you're constantly being taught by the textiles yes, what resonates yes. with you and what you want to do more of in the next piece. And so if we can keep ourselves from getting gummed up in any one spot, then we'll get to somewhere beautiful eventually. Absolutely. Yeah. This kind of goes back to like, you got to make bad work. You, you gotta, just got to make the work. Please. Just make whatever. Yeah. Even if, no, that's not true. Like there are times when you should take a break. <laughs> you don't, <laughs> nothing, nothing in nature. I'm t- this is a pep talk for myself. Uh-huh. <laughs> nothing in nature blooms year round. That's true. And, you know, we can't always be creating. Um, but, you know, when you don't know what to do, just do something. Just, just, just cut up something you already have and put it back together. You know, I think and even if you hate it, you've done something you've made. And then maybe you'll come back to it and learn something from it. But, yeah, I think working with large volume of, of making it is really, is really smart. And that's how you develop as an artist as well. That makes me think of Picasso said, you know, problematic Picasso aside, Picasso did say this one <laughs> good thing, which is inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Right. Yeah. So you, so I try to remember that and not wait for inspiration and then go start picking fabrics. No, let me go pick fabrics and then see yeah. what starts sparking and catching my attention. And go with that. Yeah, it happens in the flow. You have to you have to get it moving. So as a way of beginning to wrap up, Victoria, if you had to make a first pass at the thesis question of my life, and sounds like your life as well, <laughs> what has been the inner work of fabric for you? How has working with textiles made you more human, put you in touch with some part of yourself that otherwise may not have been possible, or at least as easy if it weren't for textiles? Yeah, this is such an intrinsic question to my life. It's almost too big and too close to even verbalize an answer to in some ways. But I think textiles are just such a huge part of who I am. And working with textiles, creating, you know, quilts, embroidery, knit, knitting, tatting. I do lots of things. I come from, you know, a lineage of of textile workers and it's always been present in my life and it's, 
you know, it's just such a huge part of who I am and how I function in this world that without it, I'm not sure who I would even be. So when I can't, when I feel like I can't make work, I feel very out of sorts when I can't work with textiles. So I just think it's sort of an imperative for me. And, you know, we can talk about all the metaphors that there are, you know, threads of of my lineage and all of this, but it's real for me. It's truly a part of my fabric of my life, just to make a little pun there. I would not be who I am without textiles. And that makes me think that so many people call textiles our first home and our second skin. Yes. Like, how do we even begin to conceive of this life without our second skin or this first home, this first roof over our heads and the clothes that we wear? It's really hard. Yeah, I just think working with textiles is kind of also you know, cutting up and sewing back together is kind of how I make sense of, of the world. It's definitely my meditation, my moving meditation. It's where I go when I am happy, when I'm sad, when I need to work through things. It's truly the way I process the world. Victoria, who are three artists that you follow that you think everybody should be paying more attention to? Yeah, this was a difficult assignment. <laughs> Well, I was like, Zach Foster, Heidi <laughs> Park. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, I went with non-quilters because I figured I'd like to hope that folks would find new artists or new people to follow. The first one is Diani Whitehawk. I think her Instagram is D Whitehawk. She's a Lakota artist who does the most amazing beadwork, like geometric abstraction, kind of very quilt-like, actually, like. I, I see her work and I think, oh, I, I want to make that as a quilt. It's beautiful. Just absolutely stunning. I recently found her work and just fell in love. The second one would be Intelligent Mischief on Instagram. They're a collective of, I think, a Brooklyn-based collective of Black artists who post these often collaged artworks with with opposed sort of hypothetical to do the work now to envision a positive future. So I just, they're always posing these incredible questions, which I feel like you do often as well. That's another one. And then the last one would be, he's actually a musician, but I follow him for his tarot astrology readings, Chris Corsini. He offers like monthly horoscope through tarot for all of the astrological signs. So every month, re religiously, I watch his Libra and Sagittarius because I'm Libra sun, Sagittarius rising and moon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm telling you, he helps guide me. Like it's, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. And he's just delightful to watch as well. And he offers his work. So it's free on Instagram, but he offers all of his workshops, pay what you can. So He's just very much about shared abundance, which I am as well. So I feel like I get a lot of guidance with that as well from him. All right. We're going to get all three of those artists linked on the episode webpage, along with images from the beautiful quilts that you've made and pieces that you've made. So folks can see for themselves what we're talking about, you know, because pictures worth yeah. a thousand words, as they say. Absolutely. Before we <laughs> wrap up, Victoria, I want to show you the card, the tarot card that I drew before our conversation. And I've never done this before. Not really. I mean, I did with Paolo kind of, but this is different. So I thought, what's what's one energy that I want to pay attention to in this conversation? And so then I drew this card. It's the magician card for folks who are familiar. Yeah. Can you just describe what you see in this card, please? There's a dude with a like white uh, tunic and a red sort of cloak over it uh holding up a wand i assume what is that uh it's got an infinity symbol over their head a cup and a pentacle is that what that is on the table with the table in front of them flowers in the foreground and hanging from above yeah yeah, yeah. and one of the things i think about so much with the magician is that is the phrase as above so below mm. meaning as it exists in heaven, let's make it on earth. Or as yeah. the ideal is, let's make that reality. Absolutely. Right? And I feel like yeah. that's a lot of the energy that you've been bringing to this conversation of this, this acknowledgement that here where we are right now isn't the place we know we can be. 
but you're yeah. actively working to call that place into reality. So thank you for the work that you're doing, even on the days oh. where it's not <laughs> easy and you got pressed from all sides. But thank you for doing what you do, Victoria. Oh, same to you, Zach. You're just an absolute delight. And I'm so thankful that you're in the world and doing the work that you're doing. I absolutely loved this conversation with Victoria. Her vulnerability and authenticity, yet hopefulness and optimism for the ways that community can pull us together are inspiring to me and so many people. If what Victoria was saying resonated with you and you would like to support her, I know one thing she has on the side is this buy me a coffee membership, just a few bucks a month, would help support the work that she does with the pay as you wish, as well as all the other projects that don't make it to the light of day because you know what? Time is limited. You know what that's like. So check out the show notes below for a link to Victoria's Buy Me a Coffee membership. All that said, I hope you'll come check us out for one of those all weekend sewing circles. And between now and then, I hope you're up to something good. I hope you're sewing something good. And I hope to see you soon. Maybe on the nook. Who knows?